Good. So, yeah, the first talk is the spread of the sapphire slammer SQL worm, as you can see. So we have a cast of dis a distinguished cast of thousands involved with uh, putting together this talk. But uh, Nick Weaver from Silicon Defense and UC Berkeley is going to come up and uh, talk to us about our recent uh, recent attack and in our interest in Nanaga being relevant to today's issues. This is a uh, kind of stuck this in the agenda relatively last minute. So Nick, come on up and uh, look forward to this one. Thank you very much. This work was done with David Moore of CADA and UC San Diego, Vern Paxson of Lawrence Berkeley Labs and ICIR, uh, Stephen Savage of UC San Diego, Colleen Shannon of CADA, Stuart Sanford of Silicon Defense, and myself. Um, I'm the one giving the talk simply because everybody else had SIGCOM deadlines. Um, being being associated with CADA, we always have to start with the nice little graphic. At just before 9.30 p.m. Pacific time, we saw no infections of sapphire. Within 30 minutes, we saw 75,000. Most of these infections actually occurred within the first 10 minutes. We created our data using network telescopes. This is the same technique used in the backscatter papers and the code red analysis. That is, we monitor large address ranges for incoming packets, and we either sample or uh, record entire traces. And we used several different address ranges for this analysis. Um, so what was Sapphire? It was a single packet UDP worm that attacked both Microsoft SQL Server and Microsoft SQL Server Desktop Edition, which is a scaled down version of the SQL Server bundled with all sorts of applications. Um, and it was a single packet UDP worm. So it, with the packet, when received, executed the code that cleaned up from the buffer overflow, got a bunch of API pointers. This was all code borrowed from a previous exploit, um, creates a socket, seeds the random number generator, and goes into an infinite loop, sending copies of itself to random addresses. The two key features are this was small. This was a 404 byte packet total. Um, and it achieved worldwide spread in less than 10 minutes. Um, for the first 40 seconds, Sapphire looked like any other scanning worm, code red, etc. It just was very, very fast. Scanning worms we've been able to model in the past as a uh, sigmoid logistic function, the, the nice S curve. And uh, for the first 40 seconds, Sapphire actually matched this with a doubling time of about every eight and a half seconds. Um, one of the things to note is since we can see the early moments, and it's the same on all our data sets that have sufficient resolution, that there was no sign of a hit list or other acceleration. A hit list is a precompiled list of targets that the worm initially would attack. There's no sign of hit listing or other techniques employed, just a fast worm, fast scanning worm. And it was so fast simply because it was bandwidth limited. Code red, everybody's favorite worm, was uh, latency limited. Each thread would send out a TCP SYN to a random address and wait for either a response or a timeout and do that in a loop. Um, so of course it's limited by network latency and or the TCP timeout. And as a result, even though code red had over 100 threads, the average code red copy was only able to scan the net at about six scans per second, and the total doubling time was about once every 40 minutes. While Sapphire, by being in a effectively while one loop, is bandwidth limited on its scanner. So with a one megabit upload, you could see 280 scans per second. With a 100 megabit upload bandwidth, you'd see 28,000 scans a second. Um, and we actually saw machines transmitting at 28,000 scans a second over 100 megabit Ethernet. Um, so how fast was it? This is data scaled from one particular slash 16 where we have a full trace 
the gap is where a router temporarily decided to stop forwarding packets. Um, and the scanning rate is scaled so that it's representing how many scans are going across the internet. And within three minutes, Sapphire went from nothing to scanning the net at 55 million IP addresses per second. At that scanning rate, you obviously scan the net in less than 10 minutes. And also, we started to see local network saturations, that is, multiple infections not increasing the, the speed of the worm, within one minute, because that's when we started to deviate from our nice classic model of a scanning worm. So the question is, is Sapphire Speed an isolated case? And unfortunately, it's not. Any single packet UDP worm or single packet UDP scanner, unless deliberately rate limit or broken, will roughly scan as fast as Sapphire. Um, think of the DNS vulnerabilities that have been reported in the past with Bind, and you'll see that you could have worms attacking those populations that spread like Sapphire. More importantly, any reasonably small TCP worm, if the worm can either craft packets or has suitably large capabilities for uh, non-blocking I.O. and connection, chart, connection calls, can scan like Sapphire. You, it simply sends TCP SINs in one thread, receives the acts or processes the result of the connect calls in separate threads, and is therefore able to at least scan very close to the available bandwidth. Which leads to, of course, three rhetorical questions. How hard is it really to construct a TCP-based bandwidth-limited scanning worm? The second rhetorical question is, assuming you have a TCP bandwidth-limited scanner, how do you ensure that the worm is still able to transmit the infection when there are other copies of the worm also scanning at maximum rate. And the final rhetorical question is, what happens when somebody releases sample source code to the net for this? However, some things worked well. We kept seeing packets. Some of our windows started dropping packets, but we think it was due to local failures. Other windows kept seeing packets. So for two, three hours, we kept seeing 55 million or more scans per second across the internet. Um, another useful observation is that a substantial response actually began within two to three hours. Within three hours, we start to see a significant drop off in Sapphire scanning rate, which says that people were unplugging machines, were imposing filters. And this was on a Friday night in the U.S., so a lot of people either lost a lot of sleep or uh, were dragged away from more interesting things. However, this response only stopped Sapphire's side effects, not the spread of the worm itself. The worm had spread in 10 minutes. This was just random garbage that the worm was spewing out by this point in time. Few things that didn't. Firewalls did not work. Um, Simply, how many SQL servers should talk to the general internet and receive connections from the general internet? Very few. Um, so most infections, a lot of them were through firewalls. Uh, however, don't read too much into that because we already knew from Code Red 2 and NIMDA that a worm can exploit a single firewall breach and spread throughout the local net. However, if you have a good trace of how Sapphire behaved at a particular institution, you can get a good idea how well the institution's firewalls were actually configured. Sapphire has bugs in the random number generator, and these bugs cause it some copies to never scan the local net, and the copies that do just scan the local net as part of scanning the general internet. So infections that are generated from internal sources generally take a few minutes while infections through the firewall occur almost immediately. So if you have good traces. Any machine infected at the start was infected through the firewall. Machines that were infected a few minutes later were internal infections or infections from other trusted parties. Similarly, there are lots of reports of local switches and routers crashing generally due to outgoing traffic. 
at Berkeley in the computer science department some of our layer two switches and layer three switches that were connected to infected machines needed resetting after infected machines were removed. We expect that uh, future patches will correct these problems. Um, however, of greater concern is just how many sites lost connectivity just due to disruption of the outgoing traffic and lost internal connectivity with only a few infected machines. This suggests that people are not deploying fairness and bandwidth capping in a lot of networks um, and uh, that this represents effectively an internal sourced denial of service attack. Um, and unfortunately, some critical systems apparently did not was, are not well isolated from the network. There are reports of Bellevue Washington's 911 system, the computer terminals that they use being disrupted, as well as uh, Bank of America reports that their ATM outage was related to congestion caused by Sapphire, although they won't say anything more about that. So some thoughts on the future. Nassier worms will happen. Have we ever seen a malicious technology where the attackers have not continued to improve and refine it? Another observation, small populations are now vulnerable to very fast worms. A worm strategy that can affect 100,000 machines in 10 minutes can affect 20,000 machines in about an hour. And since we didn't see human response really start going for two to three hours, this is still sufficient to outrace human response. So the observation that small, smaller populations are less vulnerable remains, but the vulnerability is now higher. Um, from a research standpoint and a detection standpoint, we need more and wider network telescopes, wider address ranges that are actually monitoring incoming packets and recording them. Basically, we, want, we would like to be able to cover about a thousandth to a hundredth of the internet incoming packets being recorded so that we could have a hope of tracing initial points of infection and possibly use this as a detector. Such has to be a distributed window because if it's just a known single window like CADA's class eight, attackers can route around that. Um, finally, we need to start doing research on automatic defenses. Sapphire was not an isolated case. Future worms can be this fast and obviously outrace human defenses. Um, this is a big open research question. Um, and it is admittedly hard, but we did have 30 seconds to one minute or so to actually have done something about it. So this is a hard open research question. But it's obvious that we have to do this if we want to stop, stop worms. So conclusions before I start taking questions. It's, this was the first fast work. It took 10 minutes to spread worldwide. There's no way human responses could have slowed this worm spread. It was just too fast. And it also was a good, good stress test of portions of people's infrastructure. We saw a lot of local DOS attacks that a copy or two within a local network would render that network unusable. Um, this is obviously not a good thing. Also, we saw too many permissive firewalls. Um, firewalls in general are not very good against worms, but they could have been a lot better than they were against this one. Um, and some good things, the internet kept up. We kept seeing packets. And also mitigation happens very quickly if people are directly affected that one of the reasons, obviously, why mitigation happened so fast is people were going, why isn't my networking? Finding the infection infected machines and filtering them out. So at least it shows that at least it's possible to get fast, reasonably fast response to wide scale attacks. Thank you very much. Questions? That was very good. Um, you pointed out on the one hand that the cores tended to work, and I agree with that and that a lot of sites managed to DOS themselves by not eliminating this threat. And I agree with that too. But the access layer, uh, that some organizations did not appear to be infected themselves, 
because they were not evenly spreading packets over their egress lanes. They were not evenly DOSing themselves. They could see differences in their upstream bandwidth providers. That appeared to me to suggest differences in oversubscription of access layers. Because as you say, the core appeared to work. Now, I, I wonder if you've seen anything like this, any end-to-end -end latency traces, congestion samples? We don't have that data yet. If you have that data, we would love to have this for our continued analysis. Okay, but probably a follow-up discussion. It's probably not publishable, but we can do some show and tell. I think you're being overly optimistic about uh, the degree to which people are getting this cleared out of things like hosting centers. Um, at two that I work with, um, the networking folks filter out the port outbound as well as inbound. I mean, you yes. filter in both directions. So no, it's not chewing up outbound network resources, but it's continuing to reinfect back and forth between machines on the switch fabric internally as customers bring machines back online. That's not good. The only fortunate thing is that if you're infected by this, you can't be infected by a human attacker. This is one of the nice worms that removes its hole as it's infected the machine. Um, so at least they aren't notifying the rest of the world that they're vulnerable, but that's a concern. Um, if you have more data, again, we'd appreciate that. To Mike's point, um, we have some data from Akamai that looks at cross-network latency, um, TCP and UDP measurements uh, that we'll show at the BOF tonight. Um, I think that's on the agenda now uh, for people to present some other data they have for the worm. So. Thank you very much. Oh, hang on a second. Any other, any other questions uh, for, for Nick? Looks like we're, oh, we do have a, somebody else running up here, so you can't escape yet. Yeah, just one quick question. Is, um, can you model what would happen in a pure IPv6 world? Uh, in IPv6, scanning really starts to break down just because of the size of the address space. Um, in an IPv6 world, I would not build a scanning world. I'd build a different target selection strategy, just simply because the address space gets too big, at least for across the internet. Okay, but then... Given your thoughts on that, are we talking about a factor of a million slower, a factor of 10 slower? Where's the best guess? Uh, it's simply the fraction of vulnerable machines divided by the address space. And since the address space is 64 bits instead of 32 bits, over the internet, scanning doesn't work. But if there are clusters that the worm can take advantage of, so it knows that these address ranges are highly populated, you can still get scanning to work. If, if I could real quick. Just because this issue came up, I did the math. Um, if you wanted to scan a single v6 subnet where you've got the 64-bit interface IDs, and you could, you know, your scanner was good enough to do a slash 16 per second, it would still take 10 to the 10th years to scan a slash 64. Thank you. Okay, so thanks very much, Nick. Uh, again, you know, this talk was obviously put together without. Uh, many months of warning, so we appreciate your efforts in, in doing so. Um, we have a 